treatment, it's a privilege. A cash hosted jointly by uh, Indian Society of Anesthesiologists, Trishur City Branch, and the Trishur Obstetrics and Gynecological Society, uh, which we are. Living doctor sorry. associated with both uh, maternal collapse, gynecologist, and gynecologist. Hello, hello, uh, doctor. Your voice is breaking actually. Yeah, I'm sure. See, uh, my internet connection is not that very good. I'm inside the theater. That's why I was telling you. Uh, so uh, I welcome each and every one of you. Hello. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah. please proceed with the meeting. Uh, one word, I welcome everyone because you know, my net connection is not very good. So uh, please go ahead with the meeting. I welcome each and every one of you. Thank you. Hello. Hi, thank you, Doctor. Plus nine one eight one three eight. Uh, okay, so man, let's go to the presidential address. Ah, sorry, sorry. Hello. Yes, I can hear. Uh, uh... Yeah, I welcome Doctor uh, Gida, uh, President of Talks, for the presidential address. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, a warm uh, good evening to all of you and welcome Dr. Venila to our uh, Trishur. Uh, I, I, you were saying that you are not a stranger to Trishur. So uh, I think uh, that makes you one among us. And it's a pleasure to be part of a joint venture, a joint session with uh, the anesthesiologist uh, because my spouse happens to be an anesthesiologist and I know the importance of an anesthesiologist. Uh, both in my life as well as in our profession. So uh, I, we have a, uh, actually maternal collapse uh, involves us uh, obstetricians much, uh, uh, very much. And so uh, most of the time we are happy that we are giving uh, a healthy baby to a healthy mother. And that is the pleasure of being an obstetrician. But though rare, maternal collapse is one situation which nobody wants to be facing. So uh, I think uh, it's very pertinent that we should discuss about that when we are thinking about saving mothers. And I am very passionate about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the and my slogan is that no mother should uh, die giving, uh, birth, uh, bringing forth a life to the world. And as part of that, we, uh, the toxins, as well as the whole of Kerala Federation of Obstetrics and Gynecology, under the leadership of Dr. V.P. Piley, has been working from 2004 for and conducting confidential review of maternal deaths. And we have brought forth books uh, on, on this report that is a, called The Why Mothers Die. And we are conducting uh, workshops based on the findings in that. We have been conducting workshops that is the emocals, that is emergency obstetric care, as well as life sub and life sub basic life support. As well as we have uh, the after the last uh, few years, we have been uh, we have uh, found that the dealing with the maternal collapse is also very important. So we have been doing uh, obstetric rapid response <laughs> coachings. So that has been going on. So it is a pleasure that uh, you are with us, Dr. Venila. And I look forward to your talk. Uh, and uh, I, I welcome everybody. And thank you so much for this opportunity for being uh, chair, uh, for being part of this. So thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to the session directly. So so may please introduce our speaker. Sure. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, a very warm uh, good evening to one and all uh, joined us uh, for the session on uh, maternal collapse in association with uh, talks and uh, ISA Trishur City branch. Uh, today, I'm really honored to you know introduce uh, a special speaker from Apollo Women's Hospital Chennai, Dr. Venila Rajagopal, uh, 
who has been got immense experience and interest in the field of head and neck anesthesia emergency uh, surgery obstetric anesthesia infection control audits and teaching in fact she has been a uh, uh, with advanced life support instructor uh, for adult and pediatric in uk since 2008 which add value to her uh, cv also uh, she has been working uh, worked in uk for 11 years uh, and relocated to india to pursue the uh, higher end uh, you know uh, work along with uh, uh, started with kmch and now with apollo hospitals uh thank you doctor for uh, you know uh, giving us time today uh, in sharing your experience uh, as the title uh, say saving mothers uh, over to you doctor thank you very much uh, organizers <clears throat> first of all uh, uh, thank you uh, isa uh, trishur and uh, obstetrician society thank you dr geeta for a very very a uh, lovely introduction to the topic of maternal collapse and as you rightly and absolutely uh, nailed it nobody wants to uh, you know have a situation where the mother is dying we want to have a very pleasurable experience and uh, we want to make sure the mother and the baby are safe so hopefully this rare life threatening event uh, of uh, maternal collapse proceeding on to maternal death uh, doesn't happen in uh, our lives in our patients lives and we can uh, deal with them safely but there's always inadvertent effects happening and we want to be absolutely sure so uh, i will proceed on to the talk and please feel free i think you've all pioneered with the confidential inquiry which i'm really happy about i think that's the way forward because only if we have data with what we are doing we can actually have our own local guidelines that and our own local audits that's the only way forward and i really appreciate your society doing this great job um i'm just going to proceed with the sharing uh, before that are you able to see my screen am i audible yes 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 yes, yes doctor okay so um as we said we are going to be saving mothers and that's our aim so am i able to are you able to see to present yes, okay so the overview of the next uh, maybe half an hour to 40 minutes uh, what are maternal events so i would start with the basics and if it is too basic please uh, correct me i can move on to the further part because i thought there were more going when we practicing anesthesiologists as well as students uh, so what are maternal events what are the causes of maternal collapse and uh, how do they proceed to death in hospital management of common causes how to prevent cardiac arrest i think that would be the crux of my talk because once cardiac arrest in obstetrics or any other non obstetric patient happens the survival rate is 50 50 in certain situations and with, within 5 to 6 minutes the uh, you know the outcome can actually differ in an unfavorable way so our aim here is to prevent cardiac arrest uh, and that is the whole uh, aim of this talk management of obstetric cardiac arrest if at all we come to it and how the teamwork and preparedness actually help us So, what is a maternal collapse event? So, here's a picture of a typical iceberg. In the maternal mortality, that's quoted in all of these papers as six in one thousand uh, or point uh, one in uh, you know thousand, varying across the different countries from west to east. It's just the tip of the iceberg. While there is a deeper, deeper, uh, big iceberg lying underneath, which is the severe acute maternal morbidity that we face in everyday life. There's you know the usual ac one normal pregnancies that just come and deliver in the uh, unit and just walk home don't seem to really happen much these days so we are actually looking at dealing with all of these morbid patients whom we can actually save home uh, send home safely uh, the mother and the baby so what is the maternal event it's a rare but life threatening event during pregnancy and up to 6 weeks after delivery i think that's a very important thing to remember when we discharge them home uh, acute event that involves the cardiovascular respiratory or the cns system leading to reduced conscious level making the vitals unstable so it's to be remembered that any adverse event with the potential to become sentinel for example any drop in blood pressure or increased heart rate or decreased heart rate must be addressed immediately to ensure that the outcome maternal and fetal wellness is uh, appropriate 
a large number of them are preventable but um, you know we may still have catastrophes and that is why we are still talking about it high risk mothers must be identified early as i mentioned we have more and more high risk mothers and uh, uh, it's very important for us to identify them early and tailor their process of pregnancy and birth so that they have a favorable outcome so the key here is to recognize early and act promptly so what are the common causes of maternal collapse and death? Interestingly, most of our uh, data shows that vasovagal collapse, supine hypotension to postural hypotension and vasovagal collapse, followed by post uh, or seizures related to pregnancy are the most common causes of maternal collapse, which can again proceed to death if we don't attend to them immediately. Okay, And as per the data, this is actually uh, WHO data that I have got. In this pie chart, you'll see that 24% of the maternal death uh, is due to obstetric hemorrhage, and most of it being PPH, uh, a small percentage being antepartum hemorrhage, which actually have a worse uh, uh, mortality uh, risk, uh, followed by 20% being malaria and heart diseases and anemia still being existent in the low-income countries. Infection and unsafe abortion uh, causing problems, eclampsia and, uh, and all the other diseases being on the rise. So we actually going to be talking about these common causes and how to actually deal with them. So this is a graph uh, given by one of the American studies and uh, they actually show that over the years, this was published in 2017, and this actually shows data from uh, 2000, 1987 to 2017, and the blue is actually hemorrhage. Um, uh, all of these actually show that over the years, the death due to hemorrhage has decreased, hypertensive disorders has decreased, infection is more or less the same, PE has reduced a little bit, amniotic fluid a little bit, anesthesia complications have always been less and they have consistently been reducing. However, we have a rise in cardiovascular diseases, cardiomyopathy, cerebrovascular accidents and other conditions like autoimmune disorders actually leading on to morbidity. So we have a new variety of disease components coming up, maybe related to the lifestyle diseases, maybe due to late pregnancies, maybe due to IVF, but there's a lot of hormonal imbalance and other issues that we are actually facing, which cause more pregnancy-related problems, which I'm sure a lot of obstetricians and anesthetists here would appreciate in everyday practice. So um, here we are, we are dealing with problems from pre-delivery to post-delivery. It could be anything from the time you're given a spinal to just putting on the monitor where there is either a sudden uh, change in the rhythm or there is a bradyo or a tacky, or at the time of birth where, where there is a handling of tissue, where there is a sudden embolism, or it could be immediate post-op or immediately afterward, there's a sudden tachycardia and hypotension and you're immediately ringing bells. Is this a sudden PPH? Has the mother gone into h &E, Or is there an embolism happening? So, uh, uh, we should be more clued into what's happening at what time during the events that are happening. So the events may not actually go as per our plan and expectation, but it's our what the our mind doesn't know, the eyes don't see. So if we have a knowledge of what's going to happen at that particular time or what could happen, we can anticipate the issues and prevent them or deal with them as and when they happen. Yeah, so... Uh... So maternal collapse, I would like to classify them as due to maternal factors, obstetric complications, which they come with already, the anesthesia related and the surgical factors and the drugs that we actually use. So the surgical factors being the four T's that we commonly mentioned, tissue damage, uncontrolled hemorrhage, uh, uterus exteriorization, handling of other tissues and vagal. So uh, we are commonly talk about the T's of surgical uh, courses, anesthetic factors being any uh, inadvertent high spinal, inadvertent spinal after epidural, uh, difficult airway or complications related to general anesthesia, or the fear that general anesthesia may be troublesome in a pregnant woman due to a lot of physiological changes that we actually know about. Uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity is something that we should be very aware of and actually be able to deal with uh, every uh, 
obstetric unit should have a system in place and it's all well known and we are not going to reinvent the wheel. So why does anesthesia or surgery actually uh, happen to be, you know, uh, not so uh, easy because of the physiological changes. I call sometimes that the pregnancy or the pregnant women that come with don't look physiological anymore because there's more and more metabolic uh, demand. There's an increased oxygen consumption. There's a risk of hypoxia. With regards to airway, they have a risk of laryngeal edema, particularly in pair H patients and increasing age and cardiac mothers uh, gravid uterus actually decreases the venous return and if the position is not right that itself can be detrimental to the uh, patient at that particular point of time and they have risk of aspiration because of reduced lower esophageal tone so all of these are just the prime factors that i have put in although there are many other factors that actually put them at a slightly tricky uh, plane when it comes to giving them an emergency general anesthesia when it comes to drugs, uh, in addition to the anesthesia that we are actually giving, whether it is analgesia or anesthesia, uh, they may have a risk of bradycardia or tachycardia, uh, induced nausea, vomiting. Vagal tone might be, is already raised in them because we are going to, with anesthesia, they, we actually have a sympath symp sympathectomized them. Then they actually, with the pull of the peritoneum, they may actually have a brady and anaphylaxis of the drugs. When it comes to the mother, as I mentioned before, uh, as opposed to young mothers, the increased age, increased parity and obesity actually puts them at a risk. Uh, apart from that, we may have women with increasing uh, amount of comorbidities because we see that uh, there's a lot of women with congenital heart disease who have grown up because of uh, the improved uh, uh, medical facility that is available, women with chronic kidney disease. And as I mentioned in the IVF uh, group of patients, we have the APLA syndrome, uh, patients with bad obstetric history, SLE. Uh, they all we, we we deal with them on a regular basis and of course off late we have post covid related issues as well and sepsis is still uh, on the horizon we have not been able to deal with them and uh, we we are yet to conquer sepsis in uh, pregnancy and we have to be very aware of it obstetric reasons uh, IVF, multiple pregnancies, uh, PPH in the susceptible population or even the uh, you know the teenage pregnancies PIH, eclampsia, intracranial bleeds, and the pregnancy itself uh, actually poses them as a risk factor, as I mentioned before. So what are we looking at? Do we have a team who's actually aware that this is a group of patients we are dealing with and we know what to do if X, Y, Z happens? Do we Have we run through the mock drills? Do we have the appropriate equipment and adequate personnel? Do we, and the blood being the most important, you remember we said 27%, 24 to 27% of the maternal death is due to obstetric hemorrhage. And hence, for blood becomes very important or blood saving methods or alternatives have to be very important. In that case, we need to have access. Point of care testing is the reality now because there's no point sending a blood sample to now and getting it three hours later because the profile of uh, the electrolytes, the coagulation and the bleeding tendency will well have changed in an ongoing problem. And hence for point of care testing or a lab within the site is very, very important. So, uh, and obviously an ICU or a cardiology backup because no, this is not a one-man job. One anesthetist and one obstetrician is not going to be able to solve if there is a problem which is big enough so we need to have a backup so we need to have a facility or a backup team uh, to all to be available in terms of dire emergencies Um, so as I said before, we are talk, thinking about what are the causes and when we know that we have a patient in the ward, in the labor room or in the antenatal ward, how do we actually pick up problems? Say somebody with the hypertension has been admitted, is preterm, you're waiting on for time, you're waiting for control of blood pressure. How do you actually identify? So I think this is a beautiful system, the early warning system, which uh, came up from the West and we have actually adopted it. And I'm sure many other units have a system of uh, monitoring patients. So this is uh, uh, the way the chart is, uh, the monitoring nursing chart is, and this, these are the parameters that we actually measure, which is respiratory rate, oxygen saturation, and does the patient need oxygen? Yeah, uh, temperature, systolic blood pressure, diastolic, heart rate, level of consciousness based on the APU scale, Pain during labor, if the excluding the labor pain, any other sort of pain like headaches, you know, abdominal pain, epigastric pain, that sort of pain. Discharge, depending on uh, if there is sepsis or there is bleeding and proteinuria. So you have the uh, white area, which is actually the normal parameters. 
and the green is still we are in the green zone once you have a increased heart rate or a higher temperature or a lower or on the lower side you come to the amber zone which means that you're going to need help you either the nurse is alerted the duty doctor the duty doctor then alerts their obstetrician similarly once it goes beyond the red zone there is a time for the patient to be shifted to a critical care area or a higher monitoring zone so these have been very helpful and this was an article published by the british journal of midwives and uh, this system has been there for from uh, for the more than a decade and they have been continuously modifying it to actually improve so continuous audit of the system makes us uh, uh, use the system better and actually uh, go ahead oh i'm sorry uh, if uh, I'm, I'm not sure if any of you have heard about this, this is a cradle uh, traffic light shock index devised by uh, the WHO in association with the London Hospital and few in Kenya and a few in northern India, basically for the rural setup and the low resource settings. So this is a system uh, with the blood pressure and uh, uh, it tells us the systolic and diastolic and it actually gives the shock index. So heart rate divided by the systolic pressure. So it then shows us whether the patient is in the green zone, yellow zone, or the red, depending on whether it's hypotensive or hypertensive, based on the heart rate and the shock index. So then it alerts the midwife who's in the rural area to shift the patient to a higher center. And therefore, apparently, this uh, it's been going on for about uh, four years, and they have used it quite effectively. And WHO has suggested that this be used in a low resource uh, setting like in the PHCs and uh, hilly areas where there's only one hospital a few kilometers away, that sort of setup. Uh, so uh, basically, we're looking at uh, early identification before deterioration. So I was just look, uh, going to go through some uh, simple case scenarios to actually understand what could be the uh, problems and how we can deal with them. So say, for example, you would hope that nothing goes wrong uh, with uh, such a patient. A cesarean in an otherwise healthy woman with normal pregnancy uh, course, what can go off plan? You know, So if we didn't know what can go off plan, we would never be able to identified. So if we missed something in the history or examination in, uh, is inadequate, particularly if they are unbooked cases, or uh, if they uh, come in as an emergency and an anesthetist just walks in and they have to start off because it's a meconium stain like that. Say if you missed a drug history or she has a sinus bradycardia or something as simple as that, if you haven't done an ECG, then you would never know how the bradycardia can be dealt with intraoperatively. Pre-op starvation, the drugs she is on, uh, maybe something like rheumatic heart disease as a childhood that she's missed out to tell us. Um, the dose of drug, dose, drug, position, uh, it, it ought to be a traumatic, continuous vigilant monitoring throughout anesthesia because the dose is dependent upon the height, weight, BMI, and the um, condition of the patient. Surgery, handling of the tissues, the drugs that we give, each one of them have enough number of side effects and we must be aware. We are not going to just like that give a drug or a dose uh, unless necessary. So we not need to titrate the dose of syntocin uh, or methogen based on the patient's comorbidities. And similarly with tranexamic acid, we see that tranexamic acid is considered as a one-all uh, drug that's needed to prevent PPH or in the event of PPH. But again, we need to titrate it and ensure that the patient is adequately hydrated and post-op, uh, you know, DVT prophylaxis is also given. And the most important, it can have side effects and sudden hypotension. So we need to be very wary of how we administer tranexamic acid. So why is it that parturians are more susceptible? Uh, well, I mean, you, you see that the patients and the whole family, and we've heard from our grandmothers and people that it's like a life churning process for the woman after birth because it's a rebirth. And I think that's very, very true because there's so many changes happening in a woman and the hormonal changes that actually puts her at a risk. The estradiol and uh, progesterone alters the cardiac cell electrophysiology. They are at high risk of arrhythmias. Resuscitation itself can be a little complicated because uh, of the positioning, how we are actually keeping her and we are also thinking of the fetus. And we're using a, a local anesthetic very frequently and in abundance uh, with epidural, with the tab blocks that we administer. But we must remember that there is reduced clearance of drugs in this group of patients. Uh, they have a high cardiac output and they also have low alpha-1 uh, uh, glycoprotein. So it's very important that uh, we remember and titrate the dose according to the patient size and most importantly, monitor them for two, three hours afterwards. 
So in the event of maternal collapse, what do you do? The most important thing, we need to keep calm, at least on the inside, your head, even if your head is running outside, you need to look calm, appear calm and train yourself to keep calm because we are going to have to lead the team. You declare an emergency and you call for help. If you don't voice out that it's an emergency, people around will not understand. The surgeon is busy operating. The nurse is helping the surgeon. The floor nurse is also helping. If you don't actually declare that such a thing, they will not call for extra help. We won't be calling for extra help. So it's important important to call for help and follow a b c d e approach i think this is the bottom line of dealing with a maternal collapse have a systematic a b c d e approach no matter how panicky the situation can be so, so a and b you might recognize so i'm here talking about a collapsing patient it might be a problem with the airway either d uh, that you actually recognize by looking at a low or a high respiratory rate, patient is having dyspnea, that is desaturation. Or in high spinals, the first thing that can come up may be difficulty to speak. They may have a cough because of an ascending spinal, a husky voice. Uh, they might be clearing the throat or the patients might be coming up. A sensory motor deficit of the upper limbs, they might complain of shoulder discomfort or chest discomfort, which we need to address. Um, higher than coming to C, you, have a, you may have a hypotension or a hypertension. Arrhythmias, you manage each one of these uh, problems you will be dealing as per the ALS guide. And bradycardia can persist even up to the bottom, as we mentioned, prolonged lengthening of uh, conduction time. But it is about with any arrhythmia, whether it's a brady or a tachy, you want to check what is the blood pressure? Is the end organ perfusion maintained? Is the patient is not in shock, then we can wait and watch. Otherwise, you need to treat them. So what type is it? Is it sinus brady? Is it type 1 or is it type 2? Type 2 can easily progress to uh, type 3 and uh, cardiac arrest. So we need to be watching it. what is the BP. So this is how we laterally think when we see something on the monitor. The most important thing is, is there a cardiomyopathy? Is there a reason to have cardiomyopathy? What sort of a patient are we dealing with? Is that a high risk? Or has there been blood loss or something that is actually potentiating cardiomyopathy? Is there an infection? So we need to be thinking when you have a sudden change on the uh, cardiovascular parameters. When it comes to D, um, anything from an altered behavior to confusion, to seizure or a sudden drop in GCS should immediately raise an alarm and we should need to address because once the conscious level goes down, we are downhill from there in terms of A, B and C. So we need to address that straight away. And then comes E where you expose and see if there is any sudden angioedema, rashes, blood loss outside to what is visible on the surgical side from down the drapes and what is the urine output. Very, very important cue for us to say what the end organ perfusion is, particularly if the patient is uh, asleep. So at this point, we need to call for help. As always, when there is an emergency which is beyond our capacity or we need an extra pair of hands, call for help. Use your ABCD approach, escalate the monitoring and get the right team in. So uh, say, for example, there's another case, a 40-year-old uh, IVF uh, pregnancy, very precious baby, preterm. So hence, uh, she's been in the ward labor room for a couple of days. She's been on tocolytics and they were waiting. She's been given steroids, but then she's kind of persistently having contractions on and off and the C CTG doesn't look good. So they decide to take her up early morning as a semi-elective. So under spinal, cesarean done, baby well, uneventful surgeons completed. You give a you anticipate that somebody who's been a uh, uh, 40 year old IVF on tocolytics having a cesarean, you have more than one red flag here to start a uh, um, oxytocin agents. So we give in a bolus of Cinto with adequate infusion. The surgeon is happy with the contraction, closes, goes by, you do, we do the dressing. And at the end of the case, as the patient is moved from the stretcher, to feel, she begins to feel uncomfortable and becomes less responsive when the anesthetist calls the name. Monitor shows, they put the monitor back on, it shows tachycardia, very feeble pulse and patient hardly responsive and down below they see a huge pool of blood. So what do you do? Call for help. What else do you think is happening? What could have happened in this lady? Anything else that could have gone? So now 
is a situation where we recognize it's probably an atonic uterus. So we call the surgeon back into OT, we immediately get the GA reopen, and the surgeon does uh, hemostatic sutures, massages. Uh, then a senior surgeon is called because the lady is not responding. We've now given the second dose of uh, Sinto, added carboprost, um, and we then proceed to do hysterectomy because patient persistently is hypotensive tachycardic and losing blood no matter what. Um, so we had to arrange blood lines, get the warmer. Uh, after hysterectomy, we get hemostasis and um, the patient is then uh, hemodynamically stable, extubated and shifted to HDU after checking gases. So this was the process. I've told this story, which could have been a nightmare uh, on that particular day. And anyone who's faced such a situation would know what sort of chaos, because it's very easy to lose that woman if you didn't pick up at that point where you shifted from the operating table to the stretcher, what exactly happened? Because any time between uh, shifting from the theater to recovery, she could have arrested and we would be in the middle of the corridor dealing with a problem, uh, which is quite a huge problem. Number two, um, I'm thinking retrospectively, should because she had all these risk factors, should we have given carboprost before? Should we have, you know, waited in theta a little bit longer and done the hemostatic searches before? But this, it was quite strong. So maybe that was intermittent relaxation. We all know that uterine relaxation can happen a little while after, despite the oxytoxic uh, agents that we give. So uh, these are the things that I would like you to think about laterally when you see such uh, cases and actually have learning points uh, so when, you, when we further on go and do such high risk cases with high risk of PPH, we monitor them for a little bit longer. You may want to take preventive surgical devascularization steps. And most importantly, have we arranged blood for this patient beforehand? Do we make sure we have at least some blood nearby in case of emergency? I think those are the crucial uh, points that I would like you to think about when you think of these cases. I'm not sure whether we are able to interact when it comes to cases. Is there anybody able to tell, uh, give any uh, points at this point? Anything else? Uh, madam, we'll have the discussion in the end. At the end. Okay, fine. So this is actually a real case. And uh, I mean, uh, it, it was quite interesting because despite uh, having all the uh, maneuveric uh, hemostatic measures, she ended up having an hysterectomy. But uh, I mean, that, that is something, again, we were able to save the life of the mother. And that was the most uh, important thing. So uh, I thought I must uh, mention about this case uh, here. So obstetric hemorrhage, why can it be potentially catastrophic? And why do we actually go to a extent of actually doing a hysterectomy. So I'd like to just raise a few points. See, at the end of the day, we're all humans. And uh, as we do the job, we want to eliminate the human errors here. And that's why we have protocols. That's why we have teamwork. So we ensure that the patient goes home safe. So uh, most of the, a lot of times, uh, the blood loss during surgery is underestimated. Uh, because it's either failure or a denial to recognize, or we don't actually have a, a system to measure. It's off, And also it's difficult to quantify the loss because uh, amniotic fluid gushes out and so it's very difficult. But it is important to actually measure the swabs at the end of the case before they close up to actually see what's come out and does it uh, you know, uh, synchronize with what you see on the monitor and does the look of the patient look the uh, same, like in terms of anemia, paler, and uh, how hydrated or filled up she is. So he, he, trying to eliminate the human factors here. And pathophysiologically, the shock, hemorrhagic shock may well be masked until 30 to 40% of loss. And um, we know that the blood flow to uterus is at the time of labor or at the time of delivery, it's about 600 to 750 ml per minute. And within minutes, you can lose liters. And that is why it's of paramount importance that we start our oxytocin, the massage, and we immediately gain control. And we are looking at that uh, operative site at that point to ensure that the uterus is well contracted, beautiful, you've got the cricket ball consistency and the mother's pulse is good. And there is not more in the suction bottle, you're very happy. If it is not that within the next three to five minutes become very crucial. And so you give Sinto, bolus, 
you can repeat it, uh, start the infusion, again, carboprost, if that is not responding in 10 minutes, and then in the next uh, 15 minutes, if it's still not responding, you can repeat your carboprost. And this protocol must be remembered and uh, agreed with between the surgeon and anesthetist, so there is no uh, disagreement at that particular point. So every unit must have a system to work with. So we often end up giving either too little for because of the complications that we know aware of or the patient has got nausea or vomiting, but we must have a way to choose how to give like a slow infusion or a, through the drip and main, uh, ensure that the patient is reasonably comfortable. Delay to definitive surgical management is something, again, here comes the decision-making skills, which is often a skill that you attain with a lot of many years of experience, personal and by seeing others. But also, I think a lot of our simulation training and all these uh, videos that we watch from others actually help us gain that. So we know, need to know when to actually do the uh, say, for example, devascularization is necessary, we need to clamp the arteries, or if we need to uh, get a surgeon help, or whether we need to proceed with a hysterectomy. So this time and decision-making skill becomes very, very essential. And as mentioned before, blood replacement is another important thing, and we I cannot stress enough, and I think more often, Everyone here will agree that uh, we need to have a way of ensuring that we have blood replacement available in close vicinity. So this is what I was uh, mentioning about. Most of the problems is because of atonicity, 70% uh, uh, uterine muscle exhaustion. And this was the case that we mentioned about with a lot of uh, risk factors. 20% due to trauma. Uh, so we had a trial of uh, VBAC with the patient having uterine rupture, wheeled into theater afterwards. And that was pretty traumatic for the entire team, not only the patient, but we saved her. So uh, it can be quite traumatic uh, when it comes to dealing with such patients. Tissue retention, uh, particularly in molar pregnancies, uh, they can be an issue. Uh, thrombin uh, as uh, in help. Uh, this is actually a very, very small percentage that we actually worry about, but they can be the ones which are very <clears throat> detrimental with the high risk coagulopathy, the amniotic fluid embolism and the HELP syndrome patients. So hemostasis is the um, a mnemonic we use, ask for help hemostatic measures to begin. E, establish ABC blood tests and products. As for the anesthetist, M, massage uterus by manual. O, oxytocin or other prostaglandins. S, shift to OT or higher center with a, a non-pneumatic anti-shock garment if necessary with an early tranexamic acid as appropriate. Tamponade the balloon. I think this has been widely practiced now and it definitely buys the time uh, while we shift them to into OT or inside a, 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 a better center. Apply compression sutures, uh, meaning b lint sutures, uh, there are different compression sutures that surgical techniques dis, uh, de describe about and they one must be very comfortable, learn it and uh, have them comfortably uh, applied on patients. Systemic pelvic devascularization, uh, followed by I for interventional radiology, if appropriate and if you're uh, in that particular higher center. If all of this don't work, then you proceed to subtotal or total hysterectomy. So, uh, as I mentioned, blood products are very important and we have set triggers and targets and this was actually published in um, uh, BJA in uh, 2020 uh, after these uh, guidelines had come up and we triggered to say if keep uh, in the center part of your column, you have the hemoglobin, you want to keep somewhere between seven and eight, fibrinogen greater than four to allow for the clotting process to exist, a normal INR and platelets greater than 50. So we are in a world where we try not to do blood transfusion unless absolutely necessary. But if the patient's hemodynamic status and clotting factors, uh, clotting uh, tests actually prove abnormal, you need to be giving. So if the hemoglobin is less than seven, you get group specific or O negative as appropriate if they are unstable. If fibrinogen is low, as particularly in abruptions or uh, uh, AFE, you want to give fibrinogen concentrates. We are going away from giving a lot of FFPs in cryo because of the risk of ARDS. And that's why the rule of fibrinogen concentrates like we use in the liver patients has come up. And that actually is, comes in a powder form, which can be mixed up and given, and we have uh, used it. If keep the INR within normal range, and if your bedside tests prove that the INR is uh, significantly abnormal, you would give FFP. And similarly for platelets. So again, you would discuss with the lab and give. We are not just going to be pouring in. The ratio of uh, uh, transfusion is one is to one is to one. And try and keep them within normal. We will not be over-treating 
putting the risk of ARDS. But blood products is Im important when it comes to keeping the volume. Pre simple crystalloids will not keep up. So this is a simple method of if you can have a local protocol in audits, it will actually help us to have a system that actually works for us rather than following something that's just universal. Because what is available within your system only, you would be able to uh, manage. The next most important thing we have talking about here is severe preeclampsia with uh, one or more of the worsening end or organ damage signs like cardiovascular acute weight gain, breathlessness, pulmonary edema over the last 24, 48 hours, cerebral irritability, renal shutdown, fetal changes, or worsening coagulation. Obviously, it gives all sorts of red bells here because we're looking at five different organs having end organ damage. Uh, then you need to start up with the protocol here. So medical management here says that maintain measure blood pressure every 15 minutes. Patient must be on the OBSMUSE chart in a close monitoring area like a HTU or a critical care. Make sure BP is below 160 over 110. Lebetalol, second line nifedipine, monitor the response and the end organ response. We would be giving IV max sulfate if severe hypertension and onset of any other end organ damage site. It's paramount that it's given because what we are looking at is cerebral irritability due to ion channel conduction and that is where, uh, going to give us a high risk problem. And therefore, IV max sulfate is important. Uh, fluid restriction, 80 ml to, per hour. If they're taking orally, we might as well leave it with that. Output, uh, you should minimum have half ml per hour. No co or preloading, avoid volume expansion. A quick electrolytes and uh, urea LFTs would help you understand. And importantly, lactate, mother's lactate will help us understand how she is doing and how the baby will be because we are looking by how much of the aerobic and anaerobic circulation is going on. So if this preeclamptic lady actually throws a fit, what do you do? You give her a max sulfate regime, you follow uh, bolus followed by an infusion, repeat as necessary. Benzos are actually not advised because it actually prolongs the post rictal state and it's difficult for us to appreciate what's happening and that is why it's not advised. However, if necessary, you will go ahead in term. For example, if there is a recurrent seizure status, mother or baby is compromised, you would then think about airway breathing circulation securing and gentle anesthesia. So there you go. You give 100% oxygen, airway breathing circulation is uh, secure. And at this point, you have to ensure the fetal monitoring is also done and you deliver the baby by GA. Yes, this GA can be at high risk, but this mother, a compromised mother who is unconscious, we will not be proceeding with a regional. Uh, and hence, uh, but things to be aware of, uh, this is a high risk consent needs to be taken because they have a high risk of intracranial bleeds, acute pulmonary edema, hypertensive cardiomyopathy on table. At the same time, we are thinking about the mother and the baby. So uh, only if there is a recurrent persistent seizures, we will go ahead with C-section or else we'll continue the monitoring and then deliver the baby once the mother is settled. You may need echo on table. Help is another thing which we get confused when we have coagulation abnormalities. The blood smear tells us a big thing. Low platelets, liver enzymes raised can be there in PIH also. But the moment it becomes hemolytic and the platelets keep dropping, then we are thinking, should I deliver immediately? Yes, you need to deliver shortly, but pre-optimize. Take 24, 48 hours. This is what the guidelines say. And the obstetricians will decide. In the meantime, the HDU and the critical care has time to ensure this baby gets the steroids. We stabilize the mother, give some antihypertensives, magnesium. Uh, coagulation is, uh, uh, you know, optimized. If you can give a platelet transfusion, we would do that prior to surgery or on table. And then we decide whether she's suitable for regional or GA. You would check for the liver and the brain and ensure that there is nothing wrong going on like other hemorrhages or edema. So we are thinking of hepatic ruptures or hepatic bleeds at this point. So this was uh, from the best practice uh, journal in uh, 2017. I think this bell holds good in even five years later that unless the patient is in, uh, you know, more florid coagulopathy with platelets less than 70, severe hemorrhage, systolic failure and valvular stenosis, we would go ahead with regional anesthesia, spinal being the choice, uh, use vasopressors over the fluids, 
slow oxytocin, avoid ergometrin, and post-op critic continuous central line and uh, arterial line monitoring and urine output. And we'd keep her in a critical area for up to 72 hours or longer if necessary. However, if she has any of the signs that we mentioned, uh, ominal signs, we would proceed with a GA with high-risk consent and take appropriate response like we would do for a cerebral aneurysm, plan for a difficult airway, obtain the BP response, modified RSI, and careful titration of anesthesia in heart failure. So now we talk about the increasing rise of, uh, which is the cardiac diseases, uh, which... Uh, the most important thing is to uh, recognize them early. So if we have and make sure that they are done in the right place at the right time by the right team. So that's the most important thing. If they are coming in as unbooked or they are thrown on to you with no warning, uh, then still we need to make sure that you have the right team and the setup there to uh, save the mother and the baby. The baby also might have compromise. So we need to be sure. So echo on table or immediately prior to K theta, moving into theta is important. So you know the LV function is good and there's no regional wall motion abnormality uh, that's uh, that that definitely helps us because uh, you can titrate the anesthetic dose either a low dose panel or an epidural based on that so these are the algorithms that we are dealing with tachycardias and bradycardias the mo most important thing that i would like you to focus on here is this part which is if there is shock syncope myocardial ischemia or severe heart failure which are the ominous signs you would actually go on to it's an unstable patient you would actually take action immediately um, and then you would go ahead with the uh, shocking otherwise you would actually go for medical treatment okay uh, similarly, you have the bradycardia. If there is a life-threatening signs, you'd go ahead with the atropin. If not, you would actually see uh, whether uh, what is the block and uh, treat. So I, I'm not going to delve into these because this will just prolong the talk. The next important, I think the most uh, dreaded one for most of the obstetric team and uh, uh, surgeons and anesthetists is amniotic fluid embolism because this is one uh, situation where uh, it's often difficult to get the patient back if you do have one. So um, the thing is to, it's often diagnosed after ruling out all other causes if you have a sudden collapse during delivery, either in the labor room or in the theater. So the sudden presentation is acute. See, risks are induction of labor, manu manipulation of the amniotic membrane, LSCS, multiple pregnancies, age. It seems like most of our patients come into this category now. So pretty much everyone that we deal with have this risk. So what can we actually do is only to pick up and we need to actually deal with them uh, very uh, cautiously. So it's a sudden presentation is acute at or immediately after delivery, having an anaphylactoid phenomenon. It can be something which is mild, but often progresses very uh, rapidly to cardiac arrest because uh, it is a, they have a wide range of inflammatory markers released with a rise in complement system and they have a sudden uh, stimulation of uh, you know I, both the cardiac and cerebrum is suppressed so they can have PPH it's transfusion. Uh, is important in this patient because coagulopathy is the killing part. So one is to one is to one in the first instance, you check fibrinogen and replace fibrinogen and platelets ASAP. Uh, if you ha do have the time to take bloods and check the serum C3, C4 might be raised. Uh, arterial blood gases and lactate would give you an idea. See, the most of the uh, studies from across the world, UK, US, or Asia, um, they said that the outcome from amniotic fluid embolism is very poor because of coagulopathy and PPH leading on to coagulopathy and on table death or they die once they shifted to ICU. So we need to be... Um, cautious at recognizing the other causes of PPH. If you have ruled out, then you might see that when there is a sudden loss, it might be due to amniotic fluid embolism. I would like to talk about it during discussion session, actually. So this is uh, case three, 25 year old, 160 centimeter tall, 68 kg parturient. <clears throat> Previous LSCS, she still felt the tug. So she wanted a more deeper anesthesia this time. So the anesthetist decides to give a higher dose with some fentanyl. He sat her up for 30 seconds and then lay her down. And still the patient developed a tachycardia followed by sudden bradyarrhythmia and then 
uh, unable to breathe and she was almost about to arrest. So what are you thinking here? High spinal. See, the point here is to recognize that the mother is having a high spinal and immediately deal with an airway breathing circulation and deliver the baby. Because if we delay at this point, we will actually have a compromised mother and a compromised baby. So here the aim is to secure the airway, ensure your circulation is okay, get the inotropes in, fluids in, deliver the baby ASAP, maintain homeostasis, left lateral tilt, get the uh, propped up head so you actually know that the spinal will recede in the next few minutes so we know what there is an end point and if we deal with it at the right time you will have a safe patient and mother however the aim is to ensure that the dose is titrated still if you can have very obese or very thin mothers or very short mothers who can still have uh, high uh, spinals and that's why i always titrate and aim only till T4, but you can still get caught out uh, sometimes. So it's important to bear this in mind always. So as I said, from anesthetic issues, you can have high spinal drug reactions, severe anaphylaxis, um, local anesthetic toxicity, and uh, last but not the least, the difficult airway or the failed airway. I know 99% of the cases are done by spinal. However, you there's always a cord prolapse or an abruption or a, a mother who does not want spinal who ends up coming in for a, a GA anesthesia. And here is this time where you have to be well prepared and your team who's not regularly used to doing GAs should be up to date with doing a general anesthesia in the most uh, you know tricky of the patients here um, anaphylaxis it's uh, the studies show the, uh, that antibiotics are the commonest cause um, and uh, low blood pressure is the commonest presentation so what do you do the moment you recognize that a patient has had a reaction either because of deteriorating cardiovascular or symptoms or uh, respiratory symptoms or because of uh, rashes, you immediately raise the patient's legs to ensure the venous return is improved, put the head down, rush IV fluids as appropriate, maintain the blood pressure, inotropes as necessary. I, uh, you give chlorpheniramine, hydrocortisone, and the main drug, stay of drug is adrenaline. Anesthetists may titrate IV adrenaline. However, if it is happening somewhere else, you would want to give uh, adrenaline, 0.5 ml IM, uh, for an adult followed by fluid bolus can be repeated if necessary. So uh, I think everyone must be familiar with anaphylaxis because it can happen in the wards, it can be ha happening in the labor room. Uh, by the time the anesthetist comes, you want to get the right drugs and the trolley. So we have what is called the anaphylaxis box in every ward, so which has hydrocortisone, chlorpheniramine, some IV fluids, vaso, uh, phenylephrine uh, ampule is ready with a syringe and a normal saline syringe and a bag. And we also have the uh, adrenaline ready. So the nurses are uh, ready with the anaphylaxis box for duty doctors, if at all such a thing actually happens cpr is another uh, delayed cpr is often considered as a reason so people often hesitate to give the adrenaline because they think they wait for the patient to actually arrest that's not necessary a uh, half ml or a titrated dose of adrenaline if it happens in theater like we actually titrate it to 0.1 milligrams and given incremental doses it is more ideal um than delaying and waiting for the patient to arrest because it improves uh, the uh, response and the outcome. So max self toxicity um, uh, should be recognized and we have an antidote. So burp is a maneuver that is widely mentioned about decreased BP, decreased urine output, respiratory rate decreasing and petella reflex absent. So the antidote here to magnesium toxicity is uh, 10 ml of 10% calcium gluconate. So uh, they're working on the ion channels to improve the muscular activity. So the breathing and the uh, cardiac functioning is actually improved as well as the other skeletal muscle functioning. So I, I think I would like to talk uh, a minute about last, which is the local anesthetic systemic toxicity. Um, we use uh, 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 large volumes of local anesthesia in epidurals, in uh, transabdominal plane blocks, and we routinely give them and send them to the ward. So it's important to know that they can be usually when toxicity happens, it's within the first minute or so if it is an intravascular. However, if it is given in an area where uh, a body where there is an increased vascularity, for example, epidural or inadvertent vascular absorption, it can happen even after an hour or two. So so monitoring for an hour or two later is very, very important, like, for example, in the recovery or in the labor room after the completion of infusion. So um, most common presentation is 
we're talking about CNS toxicity. So we often ask, do they have an altered taste? Do they have a confusion? Uh, do they have sudden numbness? And then they actually lose consciousness, followed by cardiac problems, which is a brady or a tacky, followed by a sudden hypotension. So uh, they can affect both the CNS and CVS or followed by CNS, followed by cardiovascular. This is because local anesthesia acts on the sodium channel membranes, and these ion-gated channels are affected by the uh, which is where your neural conduction is happening. So our aim here is to call for help, start your ABC like you would do for any other collapse. And here, before uh, the days of lipodemulsion, the treatment was cardiopulmonary bypass where they would remove this blood and actually transfuse uh, other blood or ECMO is now considered as the last mode of therapy. But what is considered as the drug here is the lipid emulsion therapy, which is supposed to go mop off all the drugs from the neural receptors, like mopping effect as in a competitive inhibition and takes the drug local anesthetic out of the neurotransmitter uh, receptors and enables for the neurotransmission. So the dose is if they are <clears throat> 1 to 1 1.5 ml per kilo. So they are small, less than 70 kilos, you give 100 ml um, over two to three minutes followed by 0.25 ml per kg per minute. And then you reassess, it can be repeated uh, there is a limit to how much uh, maximum dose you can give uh, per day, but by then you should have a method of sending them to an ICU, arrange for a bypass or arrange for uh, ECMO at that stage. But the most important thing is they can have either just mild symptoms which respond to airway breathing circulation management and the patient will be reverted or they could go on to complete cardiac arrest and you have to go through the entire uh, panel of uh, treatment. So, but it's very important that your uh, hospital actually stocks this Hopefully, you will never have to use it and throw it at the end of expiry date, but a lot of pharmacies hesitate to do that, so it's very important for us to stock it. Um, <clears throat> so the ACL is for, uh, as a, uh, you know, the last toxicity, they suggest that you use a reduced dose of adrenaline because there is already a severe cardiac uh, depression, and therefore you keep it to less than one mic per kilo. Amiodarone is a drug of choice. We don't use anything else because calcium channel blockers or beta blockers because all the uh, ion gated channels are closed. Intralipid is a drug of choice and the resuscitation can take longer. So moving to a higher center or a higher critical care coming and reviewing the patient is important. So this is what we mentioned before, difficult airway or general anesthesia. It's important that all anesthetists are familiar with the DAS guidelines and the technicians or theta nurses who help you with should be familiar with what is the say, plan A and plan B and what will be the anesthetist plan, okay? Ramp position, two anesthetists ideal when there is a general anesthesia for a, a obstetric patient. A backup airway plan, cricothyroidotomy kit must be available in all uh, any theta, definitely in an obstetric theta. So in, the, in such a situation, please call for help. Stay calm and save the life. That if you panic, you'll always underperform. But it's important to follow the guidelines. So uh, these are the guidelines from Obstetric Anesthetic uh, Society of the UK. I'm not going to go further, but the whole idea is to not uh, persevere in single method. The idea is to ensure face mask ventilation is happening. No more than three, at, uh, three attempts at intubation. Use supraglottic airways, no, no more than two. By this time, the patient, uh, if it is only necessary, you proceed with surgery or else you declare that it's a failed airway and proceed with front of neck access. So this, I think every anesthetist who's practicing anesthesia must be familiar with and the system and the infrastructure must help you with this. So God forbid if all that you've done to prevent a cardiac arrest has failed and the patient has proceeded to cardiac arrest, uh, our, and it's a code blue. I think we don't really want this, but if it has happened, we proceed with the cardiac arrest algorithm. Start CPR. So CPR goes first, hands, mid-sternum, continuous chest compression, 130 uh, to 200 per minute. And the most important thing is the surface, bottom surface, the patient lying on must be a flat surface. If she's on a bed, you proceed with it if you can't alter it until you get help. But once the help arrives, if there is a transfer board that you can place, the CPR can be more effective. Uterus should be manually displaced to the left side. 
um, airway must be secured. Uh, bag mask ventilation is good enough for a smaller tube. As soon as anesthetists arrive, they will secure the airway. And ETCO2 of around 10 millimeters of mercury is suggested for fairly effective CPR. Avoid hyperventilation. Application of cricoid pressure is controversial here. You use it in case of full stomach or risk of aspiration, but if that's going to impede your uh, view, then we would uh, release it and ventilate and secure the airway. So this is what I was mentioning about a tilt, uh, left manual displacement, securing the airway and the bottom has to be a hard board. OT tables are often convenient because it's a hard surface and the effective CPR can be uh, applied. However, if they are on a um, labor room bed or a ward bed, it can be quite uh, difficult. It's important to get the surface underneath. So we follow the same ALS protocol as, uh, you know, unresponsive call for the resuscitation team to put the leads on, assess the rhythm. If it's shockable, you shock, follow CPR for two minutes and then reassess. If it's non shockable, you cast CPR and you give adrenaline and you look at the four H's and T's. And we know what the H's and T's could possibly be for that particular patient if the patient had had any preceding chart and you were thinking about why she might have arrested. So uh, there's about 50 to 60 percent chance of survival. Um, worse if they have bradyarrhythmias or asystole and uh, uh, we still uh, go ahead with our cardiac arrest protocol. Buchops is the pneumonia that we talk about. So it's about uh, whether there is a bleed, embolism, anesthetic drugs, atony, uterine atony, cardiac complications, hypertension, others being the four H's and T's, placental uh, like accreta, increta or sepsis. So these are the causes that we're thinking about as we are going through the cardiac arrest. The most important difference in ALS for an obstetric cardiac arrest is soon after cardiac arrest is diagnosed and CPR is started, we are thinking of improving the maternal outcome by uh, delivering the baby because we know that the cable compression impedes venous return and it's obviously going to affect the cardiac output of the mother. And most of the pathology is from the baby. If at all the cardiac arrest has happened because of the placental abnormality or PIH or embolism. So we filtering mortem cesarean delivery is considered ASAP. And we plan that the delay incision, a decision be made by three minutes and the incision be made by the fourth or the fifth minute. By 10 minutes, the baby must be delivered either by uh, C-section or instrumental delivery if full dilatation. So we give doses, there is no difference. Adrenaline and amiodarone, you continue as the same. And neutrotonic slow infusion after return of circulation because the heart is already uh, quite tired and weak. So the neutrotonics are quite strong drugs. So it's important that you give them only by a, a slow infusion. So talking about perimortem cesarean delivery, um, what is suggested by many of the WHO guidelines and the UK guidelines, and I think the obstetric societies here as well, is do not move the patient in loose time, particularly if you're on different floors and you don't want to be moving to OT. Perform surgical delivery, either vertical or transverse, what is appropriate for that particular baby in the labor room suite. Prepare operative area, decide to deliver by three minutes, skin incision at fourth, within five minutes, we should be doing it. This is because the persistent hypoxia or anoxia for the baby uh, and the mother actually means that both of them actually have a very poor outcome. But if you're next true to OT, then you might want to shift. So I think it depends depending upon your system. But the whole idea is do not try moving the patient and losing time. So this is what they suggest to have as a checklist in the labor room, actually. For the yellow boxes for the uh, surgeons, you actually have a tray ready with what is appropriate for a quick cesarean section. These are the suggested instruments. And the blue box is for the anesthetist. So basically, we should be having an emergency trolley for an emergency LSAs, which could potentially happen in uh, the labor room, including the difficult airway trolley. So this is the list suggested by the Obstetric Anesthetic Society of the UK. Um, so talking about the post-resuscitation care, hopefully the patient has survived and there's a return of circulation. The anesthetist team maintains the vitals by appropriate inotropes, every breathing circulation is maintained, the drugs are given, blood transfusion as necessary, investigations are sent, and we are monitoring a continuous CO2. We must remember that the patient can deteriorate still at any further point of time. Surgical team ensures that the wound is repaired. We might have shifted into OT by now, check, checked balloon tampon out of the uterus uh, because we might have uh, persistent hormonal uh, changes. 
transfer to ICU only after all of this has been secured. Uh, chest X-ray, ECG and echo will be mandatory at this point for us to uh, actually assess how the lady is going to do thereafter. So yes, so this is a, a, a case that I come across. This is about a lady, young lady, uh, 25, failure to progress, primary Paris, and had an emergency LSCS uh, in the morning time. Baby was well, mother was shifted to recovery. Two hours later, the anesthetist gets a call that the mother has collapsed in recovery. Okay, what has happened the preceding two hours, gradually increasing tachycardia attributed to pain and the mother's being given pethidin. She was also shivering, which didn't settle and the pulse oximeter was actually not picking up. Uh, the BP cuff was not going up very regularly. Uh, it so happens that when the anesthetist and the duty obstetrician came and saw, the pads were checked and there was a huge loss. By the time the investigations were taken, another line put in, she actually arrested. Um, and it took them a long time to revive her after prolonged CPR. And by the time the blood was given, it was more than four to five hours later. She succumbed to prolonged anoxia about 24, within 24 hours. So... Um, this is actually a well patient who was supposed to go home in 24, 48 hours time. However, she did, it, she did not go home. Why did it happen? Could it have been just PPH missed uh, in, the, in the first hour? Or was it amniotic fluid embolism, which represented later? Was it any other drug anaphylaxis that happened inside that point? Why did coagulopathy actually develop? It was difficult to find out what, why, and when happened was not we were not able to decide because uh, this was actually a case not, not in our hospital, but a different place. We could not actually see because um, we didn't have the timeline. So what needed there, what was necessary there, could it be prevented by continued monitoring, more closer monitoring, early recognition of whatever problem it was and a prompt action. So systems must be in place. No patient can be taken, you know, as a simple case of cesarean um, because we do not know what other problems the patient has hidden because we don't actually investigate all the systems all the time unless they actually have a complaint. So um, essentially it's a teamwork. So we, if we have regular drills and a whole team needs to know what to do, the role play of teamwork, strong liaison between the staff and doctors, as well as the blood bank becomes very important. High risk consent and, and informed consent is very important. So we actually avoid medical legal issues because they must understand if, whether it's a booked case or an unbooked case, who we are actually dealing with, what sort of problems we are going to have. On the day, if once you've declared emergency, you call for help, you know, there's one person who takes up the leads and one few who perform. It's very important for all of them to have the situation awareness and go back to ABCD if you lose track. Documentation by timeline and communication with family becomes very essential. It's all the more essential when you go back to look at the case, both for learning purposes as well as for medical legal. Post-event, it's important that everyone takes the time to debrief on the session and analyze the root cause analysis. And most importantly, no blame is very, very important. I think that's very essential for a teamwork because no one actually comes to work to do something wrong. And uh, But it's important that we have systems in place so we can avoid such events. So in summary, maternal um, collapse and events can lead to serious morbidity or mortality if they're not addressed immediately. The key is appropriate monitoring, early recognition and active management, regular drills and training would make it more easy and second nature for people involved to actually deal with emergencies when they do happen. Otherwise, it takes years for every technician and nurse to actually learn. And at this point of time, with the staff attrition, it's important for us to conduct regular teaching sessions. You build a team with appropriate personnel and have a plan A and plan B. So keep calm and stay safe. Uh, this is the link uh, for uh, the um, British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology article from which most of this information has been uh, taken. And thank you very much for patient listening. Thank you, uh, Dr. Vendila. I think Arun, can I make a few comments? Hey, yes, madam, yes, ma'am, sure. Yes. Yeah, uh, that was an excellent uh, uh, and uh, very informative session. And uh, I think uh, uh, we have been extremely benefited by that. I would like to add a few comments, if I may. Sure, ma'am. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, actually, about, as you said, 
the teamwork is very important and that we have recognized. And so that's why we have been trying to, because uh, from our confidential inquiry, we have found that many of these catastrophes occur in small setups. So there to imagine all these things happening may be a little bit extreme. So what we need is to have the, all the people there, probably everybody should be trained, starting from staff to uh, whoever is there available to be trained for the initial the ABC or whatever, the initial uh, response. So that is what uh, is required. And that's why the rapid response team training has been started by the Kerala Federation. Okay. So that is one point. And so that is uh, why uh, in these small setups, what we need is that they respond immediately and then ship the patient to the uh, uh, this thing, uh, to the referral center. I and, uh, uh, basically, as you said, PPH, PIH, all those are the main causes for the maternal mortality that is there everywhere. Even if uh, USA is, uh, that, uh, and the UK, that uh, incidence of PPH has come down. In the other, all over the world, PPH is still the main cause for uh, this thing. So what we are trying to do now is to reduce the, uh, the, the, the has been a meaning like as uh, Dr. Piley says, there should be a paradigm shift in the thought process. So we don't go with the hemostasis. The first and foremost, what we do is try to stop the bleeding then and there. So we have developed actually our, uh, some of our uh, um, faculty themselves have developed some instruments which will help immediate stoppage of bleeding. Like Dr. Pili has developed a clamp, transvaginal uterine artery clamp. Dr. Samatram has developed a cannula which will reduce the bleeding. So there are some things which have been developed for the uh, that particular this thing, uh, control of the PPH. And uh, as you said, the new start definitely we have um, many of us are following the new start now, which has been found quite useful. And uh, one suggestion that you made that we can alter it according to our situation. That's also very welcome. I think that will help a lot more for acceptance by the staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so one more thing that I uh, appreciated really is that when patient comes from outside, very often we, uh, we fall into the trap of trying to resuscitate the patient without, and then uh, we end up uh, making some uh, error in the uh, in giving of the drugs or whatever without going through the entire uh, papers. So that is also important. Then uh, um, in the, I think it was uh, the last case or it was case number three or you, you had the patient who had uh, who had collapsed two hours after the, uh, so for the um, main causes of uh, maternal death, we have developed certain quality, uh, meaning like uh, quality standard points. PPH, one of the standard points that we have uh, tried to inculcate into our practice is, uh, is to have a fourth stage monitoring. Whether it is a uh, normal delivery, that probably we uh, everybody may be doing, but that is applicable also to the cesarean section. And in that, we uh, um, in the training sessions, we, uh, um, we stress that they should be um, uh, not only the bleeding, but also we should see whether the uterus is well contracted, press the uterus, see whether there is a bleeding. So those things are important. So that is uh, part of our training. So that fourth stage monitoring, personally, I feel that patient probably with a little bit of fourth, a, four, a proper fourth stage monitoring, she might have um, uh, been able, um, we might have uh, prevented that uh, collapse. So uh, these are the uh, things. And then... Uh, uh, so, I think uh, uh, those are the things that I wanted to add. And that was a really, really excellent talk, uh, Dr. Vanilla. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much, ma'am. And, and, I, uh, and I really uh, I mean, I can see the passion in uh, you as well, because uh, this is a topic that's very close to me. And I've talked about this and I because we're practicing and I really don't want to see another, any woman uh, you know, dying in oh, within our uh, so uh, I always uh, have very close to our heart. Uh, I mean, ma'am, I would like to. Is there a website for your uh, federation? I would probably yes, get in definitely, touch definitely, about your guidelines. Yes, I'll yes, get your yes. number from Dr. Arun. No, and this, I'll is speak the, to you. this is our uh, that Why Mothers Die book. 
Uh, that okay. we have. This is similar our to book. our uh, UK book as well. So yeah, yeah. I will and have a look at it. We have got a small handbook for our ORRT training as well. Very nice. So these are all. No, no, no. That. Actually, <laughs> these are all uh, because Thank thanks you. to Dr. Uh, Piley, who is our leader and our uh, role model. So we have uh, we in the Kerala are all so fortunate that we have leaders who think ahead. And uh, the CRMD, uh, we are uh, we are all proud that we are part of the CRMD process. Excellent. So it has improved our outlook so much and in, improved our practice. Very and good. I think we are, that is why we have a very low uh, uh, maternal mortality, and we are striving to uh, bring it to a zero uh, preventable maternal death. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Madam, uh, uh, one or two announcements. So those who have uh, questions to ask can directly unmute themselves and can ask uh, directly to Madam. Uh, and uh, for participation e-certificate, uh, please uh, follow the link at the, uh, that, that is given in the chat box. And uh, one uh, rare uh, incident of maternal collapse is, uh, a severe acute pancreatitis, madam. Mm. Uh, actually, I, I had a case of uh, severe acute pancreatitis. Uh, it, it mimics as acute uh, placental abruption or uh, something. There, had a, there was a small bleeding, intrauterine bleeding. And uh, uh, we have given the GA and uh, suddenly the patient collapsed. And uh, the uh, aspiration, uh, the patient went uh, into aspiration and the aspiration fluid was something like a fecal uh, matter so uh, uh, then when we, yeah and when we de did the lab investigation when we found out that it was acute pancreatitis uh, it's it's uh, it's rare but uh, uh, it's also a cause of uh, maternal collapse and a uh, few more questions in the chat box um, somebody had just uh, asked about uh... Is syntocinone synonymous with carbitocin? No. no, no, no. Um, so I think carbitocin uh, is a different drug. It is not a combination of carboprost and syntocinone like many doctors seem to think. Uh, it is another drug, an analog, which can actually act on the same receptor, lasts a little longer. It doesn't need a fridge. It is heat stable. And henceforth, that is the most important criteria for to use that. And it's longer acting than syntocinone. So a single dose is sufficient in most cases. However, it, you go with the clinical scenario. If one dose is not enough, you start a sento infusion or add carboprost as necessary. But usually they say that after carbotocin, you go on to carboprost. No, not uh, sento will not act. Um, so far, this is the information I have. We have started using it last four months on and off, and uh, it seems to work effectively in low-risk patients. Um, we haven't used it in high-risk uh, patients yet. Uh, you can share the experience. Yeah, we have we have not started using it all that much because of likely because of the cost factor. But we are planning to uh, use it, and then uh, we are starting slowly. So mm. probably we'll be able to get back on the uh, um, what what is the response uh, maybe in another six months or so. Okay. I mean, I'm also plan. I mean, we are actually doing it by November. We may have a better answer. I mean, it's too early to say about it yet. But no side effects as of now. We have not had any un undue nausea, vomiting, or tachycardia, which is the worst thing that the Sinto patients don't like. Um, I'm looking at another question about adrenaline, noradrenaline or adrenaline. So oh, I no. think uh, in PPH or any, any um, in cesarean sections, uh, in obstetrics, noradrenaline is a good drug of choice. Uh, as you fill them up with IV fluids in PPH, until you're waiting for blood, you can use a vasopressor if you think that you have filled up, not in a dry patient. Uh, but yes, noradrenaline would be the first drug of uh, choice once, I mean, you can't be giving phenylephrine plus ephedrine. So you would be starting a noradrenaline, which is the best uh, vasopressor of choice. It's well documented and there is enough guidelines to say about that. Um, help with the DIC on FFP, PCV, cryo still not improving. What to do next? I think help syndromes can be very tricky. I think... Um, 
It is not a single answer that I'll be able to give here. You have to look at the patient as a whole. Probably all the coagulation parameters with the help of hematologist, you'd be able to uh, decide uh, what exactly, because they will go through the full cycle of ARDS, even if you have settled the hemorrhage for them to actually revert, they actually have a high risk of mortality if it is severe help. I think it's about 6%, isn't it, ma'am? So they, they can actually have a bad prognosis. So if um, they have tried uh, uh, yeah, postpartum eclampsia. Postpartum eclampsia, we, in fact, in this week, we had three patients coming on day six, day seven, and we were wondering why. But yes, uh, they all had... Uh, you, you can still, there's a controversy, I think, madam, about uh, using max sulfate in uh, postpartum because a lot of doctors seem to believe that magnesium is only for fetal uh, support, mm -hmm. brain protection. Mm -hmm. yeah, so uh, I try to stress here that it is very, very important uh, mm -hmm. that you save, use the same drug to protect the mother's brain. So the max self used is to protect the mother's brain and for electrical stability in all the nerve potentials in the body. So you follow the same protocol whether it is prepartum intrapartum postpartum eclampsia same management uh hello ma'am can i talk hi yes yeah thank you thank you so much for such an informative talk i have a question that if the patient develops amniotic fluid embolism and has a cardiac arrest uh, most of the times it remains a clinical diagnosis am i right Correct. or do we have some investigation to rule out no, it's so, a, it's uh, a it's diagnosis patient... that we come by ruling out others because of, so the only cue, as we mentioned, is when there is a sudden deterioration at or immediately after delivery. Mm -hmm. So during uh, evacuation of the amniotic membrane or while it's being corrupt, or when there are two twins or triplets, when there are more than one amniotic membrane and there is a residual material, when there is a chance of uh, reverse flow then you might have a risk of amniotic fluid. So sudden collapse, sudden presentation, where you would think like an anaphylactoid, the investigation that they have suggested is uh, mast cell triptase levels and complement levels, C3, C4 levels, and fibrinogen. These are the four that the Royal College Obstetric Anesthetic Association guidelines say. If you can immediately take bloods off and send for these uh, low fibrinogen, less than 2 grams, C3C4 elevated and triptase elevated, it is more likely that it is amniotic fluid embolism. Have I, am I clear? I mean, the uh, unfold, fortunately, I have not dealt with any severe amniotic fluid embolism, but uh, if there is such a situation, this is what I would do. Uh, I think the uh, obstetric OAA, UK book has clear guidelines on AFE on sudden recognition and as you rightly said it's a clinical diagnosis by ruling out others yes because common things being common you would look at bleeding uh, and coagulopathy and then you'd think of AFE yeah. yes. uh, there are a few more questions in the chat box also madam okay there's three people raised hands I think Pankaj yeah. sir is there uh, Good evening, can, sir. Good evening, sir. Uh, can you unmute and? Yeah. Hello. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Hi. Fantastic, madam, as always. Thank you. Thank uh, you, sir. Dr. Pankaj Gupta from Nasik. Uh, nice nice to meet you, sir. Yeah. Yes, madam. Regarding carbitocin, uh, madam. Yes, I have mean, uh, used it in about uh, 50 odd cases. Okay. And the results are just fantastic. Okay. Excellent. Uh, be before this, we were using always pitocin followed by postodin. Mm -hmm. Almost all uh, all uh, caesarean sections. Mm -hmm. But since uh, carbitocin has come in, we have stopped using everything else. Only okay. carbitocin, single dose. Even a uh, second dose is not required. Correct, yeah. So the results are fantastic. And guys. even in oh. uh, previous LSAS patients, uh, big babies, every all of everything, them. Every, every, everything, madam. 100 yeah. micrograms, give it slowly over one minute. Yeah. And uh, a patient has no nausea, no vomiting. Correct. No, yeah, that is what uh, I no, noticed as well. No, card, no cardiovascular changes. Absolutely fantastic drug, I feel. Yeah. It's really worth it. I mean, it should strongly be recommended. Correct. That's our feedback as well so far, but I think we should use it more often. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's, it's just, uh, just fantastic, madam. I'm a private practitioner. So okay. we always yeah. are worried about, uh, you know, cost and other things. Correct. But even if it is some this is worth it. Is really worth it. Really worth it, madam. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And regarding with this amniotic fluid embolism, I believe there is some staining studies which I remember reading about. Some staining is done and in some way they can diagnose amniotic fluid embolism. 
I'm not very sure about it. See, there are some state studies. That is about the postmortem study. Postmortem, yeah. Uh, but we are talking about hopefully alive mothers. So. Okay. <laughs> the only way to uh, diagnose is uh, that would be uh, go and check for the tissues and. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, ma'am. Clinical thank you. diagnosis thank you, and suddenly the patient has hypotension, hypoxia, and respiratory distress. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is in the thirty minutes following delivery or during labor. So it's mostly a clinical diagnosis, and depending on the situation of the patient, we may have to. Uh, 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 resuscitate her immediately. That's the best bet you have with the amniotic fluid embolus. Correct. Yeah. Otherwise, she is likely to go in. Anyway, she is likely to go in for coagulation, uh, coagulopathy, and other problems. Yeah. In fact, madam, uh, there was a uh, there was a recent uh, case which I went against the anesthetist in Kerala itself. I feel uh, where the patient before being shifted suddenly. Collapsed and uh, expired. Now that was an abruption patient, and the doctor was very uh, uh, had the presence of mind to do a perimortem section immediately, and uh, then she was uh, supported by the rest of the. And thankfully, the mother and the baby are extremely uh, meaning are okay. Now. So oh, that, okay. that was a, that was an excellent uh, uh, job done by the junior surgeon. No, this was I regarding think, uh, I... our, uh, our discussions in the. Uh, so in that context, I would like to add that our work with the immocals and the, uh, we have something called the near miss reviews also. Not only the maternal deaths, we have something called the near miss reviews, which help us to uh, have an idea of, of as to how to deal with it. So the yeah, I think that's both reviews, which is conducted every month in the districts. So that will enable those uh, juniors to something like a drill. So that was yeah. in the back of her mind. She was saying, I remembered my senior saying this, this, this. So that was what helped her to do it at that point of time. She didn't even wait for the scalpel to be put into that, uh, uh, this thing. She immediately did it with the plain scalpel blade. And then she could save the mother, which is, which is very uh, meaning like it should be appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. See, that is why we talk about these drills and attending sessions, workshops, and we have the simulation center in our hospital. And we run it, as you rightly said, now, not just the doctors, but as a whole team, the drill is conducted for right from the staff to the technicians to anesthetists and surgeons. So we know how the role play works and what to do when the eventuality happens. Uh, so, yeah. Serena, madam, you would like to add something, ma'am? No, in fact, in fact, I was just enjoying the session. Uh, Dr. Vanilla, it was a very good practical session, I should say. And I think one of the best statements you made was that when there is a problem, declare emergency. I think that is so important because many times when there is an anesthetic problem, you try not to disturb the surgeon. And then you do whatever you can within the little help that you have. In fact, once you declare an emergency, you know, two, three people from other theaters can rush in, help you. And, you know, more hands, more the merrier. This is one such situation. And I also like the way you said um, that patient of in one of the cases which you quoted, you said you uh, the decision was very important. Actually, that is the right thing that you said. Yes. You understand if at that point of time when the patient collapsed, if yeah. you tried doing the devascularizing sutures and the compression sutures, you would have lost the patient. Yeah. That presence of mind to immediately take and do a hysterectomy, that yeah. was the most practical and life-saving situation, I should say. Yeah. Absolutely. And I've also noticed that, you know, in the event of an amniotic fluid embolism, there are two situations which we actually come across. One is when the patient arrests, then of course the prognosis is very bad. But yeah. sometimes she collapses but is still alive. Mm. That is the situation we should actually capitalize on and save. Correct. Because yeah. many times, you know, the amniotic fluid need not be a huge embolism. It could be small and you can actually salvage the patient. And mm. as you rightly said, what we really see at that point of time, apart from the hypotension and the hypoxia, it is massive bleed. And mm. the, that bleeding is actually the DIC bleed. You know, that DIC, it, that immediately should cleanse the diagnosis of an amniotic fluid embolism. And basically, as you said, you know, it is, you know, everyone should be tuned to it. And that you can only do when you get repeated, you know, repeated 
training session so that everyone knows what to do. That is the only way you can bring down the MMR. Absolutely. There is no other way of, you know, just once in a way attending a meeting and learning. It should be there in place so that everyone knows what should be done. And everyone just takes it and does the thing, you know, and so that you can save the mother because here life is so important, so important. And uh, and often there's only a few minutes, so uh, yeah, yeah. the right decision. And that very active management. Mm -hmm. And if I may just add a word about carbitocin, which you said, carbitocin is not actually used in the treatment of PPH. It is more for the active management of third stage. Because when there is a PPH, you require all the uterotonics and here you can do only one. And as you rightly said, many times it actually blocks the receptors. So then it takes a little time for it to be released because it's long, it's half-life is more than 40 minutes. Oh. So that and is why we are a little hesitant to use in the high-risk patients or the IOLs or IVF. So we are using them in the normal ones, but uh, I mean, I, I guess we have to. So if, if there is an issue for 40 minutes, then would you start off a into or just go ahead with carboprost? I think carboprost would be a... Everything. Yeah. And give solution also. Sometimes it will slowly leave the receptors, and you know, it's an mm -hmm. ongoing process, right? 40 minutes will just fly past. Mm -hmm. So it's really the, but the, the best thing that carbon frost has done is that it is heat stable, so it's off the shelf. So yes, without I think uh, during COVID, yeah. it was very yeah. helpful because the cold storage yeah. is really an issue, transfer to small hospitals, and that's when I think they brought it into India quite swiftly. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for your input. Thank you. It's a good talk. I, mean, I could see from your talk that you're actually dealing with such emergencies. Yeah. Be like Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, Dr. Spacey, madam. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Renila, for such a wonderful session. It's a real pleasure yes, to have you spoken about such a vital topic, which is uh, actually lots of uh, hospitals and maybe so many small institutes would not know exactly what to do, how to deal with such a situation. Maternal collapse is such an important topic, and I think all of us would be very uh, should be having drills quite frequently in our maternities to handle such situations. Regarding carbitocin, we had a lot of uh, we have been using carbitocin for a long time. As you said, carbitocin, it's a, it's a, uses up the receptors of the oxytocin. So if it has to be used, it's the best choice to be used as a first go during a third stage. Because once the receptors are occupied by oxytocin, when you use carbitocin, it will not work. Yeah. So what happens is that certain recommendations are there, like SOGC recommends carbitocin to use as a first choice in the second, third stage of labor, when you have a risk score of two or more for PPH. So our institute in Abu Dhabi used to use carbitocin for all cases of uh, yeah, scissor infections as the first choice. And mm -hmm. they have shown that the incidence of PPH has been reduced over, yeah. and over so many years. Right. We, understand, we understand that it is expensive. That's mm -hmm. a limiting factor, but when there is a score of more for a high risk for a PPH. I think it can be considered as the first choice when we have the resources. And yes. thank you very much for such a wonderful talk. It was really enjoying. We went through like a video on a maternal collapse. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Thank baby. you very much. So uh, before we uh, conclude the session, uh, we have a few announcements to make. <coughs> uh, so, uh, this is a uh, uh, <coughs> first time uh, ex uh, medical expo coming up in uh, Adlex International in Kerala on September 23, 24, and 25. And Indian Society of Anesthesiologists is associating with Indian Medical Association uh, for this expo. So uh, we would like to invite all the uh, participants for this. And uh, our next session uh, will be on uh, 23rd June uh, regarding the financial literacy. Uh, so by our expert speaker, Dr. Tanmay Motiwala, he's actually a uh, MCH uh, junior resident in All India Institute of Medical Science, Jodhpur. 
<clears throat> so uh, and we have an ultrasound guided uh, regional nerve block uh, cme and workshop uh, in collaboration with the De department of anesthesia of daya hospital trichur uh, so uh, we have a hands on training on july 3rd so for all these uh, details uh, kindly contact uh, saumya and uh, for all these uh, recorded Uh, uh, videos of this session uh, you can subscribe to our isa thrissur youtube channel <coughs> uh, so uh, for uh, uh, for the concluding uh, remarks and a word of thanks i would like to uh, invite dr pramila menon secretary of talks madam thank you dr arun um first of all let me thank you for uh, making us a partner in this uh, joint venture and uh, dr venila it was really nice to hear you uh, you um, with a come a group of two a group of people one from anesthesia and one from gynec uh, to deliver such a talk is really difficult because you have to satisfy both the people and i think you just made it into the right extent so that both of them uh, could be satisfied and it was really uh, good and uh, so thank Thank you so much for such an interesting talk, and I think all the we had more than eighty participants here, and all of them would have benefited from it. So thank you so much, and uh, thank you, Gita, Madam, and uh, thank you, Dr. Nivin, and th thank you, Dr. Iron, for uh, uh, participating here. And uh, I think it was really wonderful. We all enjoyed it. Thank you. Much. And uh, we Asia, like it's been great uh, to be here. <laughs> we would like to thank our. Uh, Uh, technical partner uh, Med Piper, Saumya, and uh, Sumitra from Med Piper team who did all the uh, uh, promotions and uh, all the technical work. Thank you, Saumya. <laughs>